talk about the channels with which we receive the word of God. How do we receive the word of God in real time? Number one, number one major channel with which we receive the word of God, the number one major channel with which we receive the word of God is through dreams. Is true what? Is true dreams. We receive the word of God by dreams. And when I say the word of God, I'm talking about the word of God to you. We receive the word of God by way of dreams. Number two, we receive the word of God by way of vision. And number three, we receive the word of God by way of in spirit communication. All together. We receive the word of God by way of dreams, by way of vision, by way of in spirit communication. Now you must be trained in these three major channels. The disciples of old received directions in dreams. We saw the direction that Peter received in a dream. Even though some Christians say the fact that Peter had that dream, it means that any we cannot eat unclean animals. Some sitting here, I don't eat unclean animals. I don't. The aim of that dream was not to encourage Peter to eat unclean animals because the dream was later understood. Why, why do we do this? Why do we do this to the word of God? You see, I personally, even though I, I'm a Gentile and the Lord has engrafted me into the faith, I will not force anyone who wants to eat unclean animals, but I will not eat it. And I will not misinterpret Peter's dream as license because after that dream, Peter did not continue I said, okay, now I'm going to begin to eat unclean animals. In fact, he wrestled with the fact that Jesus was telling him to eat unclean animals. Because Jesus never taught them to do that. So he wrestled with that fact. How would they? He said, not so, Lord. How would the Lord tell me to eat unclean animals? It was later he understood what the vision meant. Now someone takes that as a yastic and says, okay, but it also means that um, we, can go, we can go and begin to eat unclean animals. All together. But that's, that, that's by the way. So, dreams are one of the ways with which God communicates to us. By dreams. By what? By dreams. By what? By dreams. All together. Number two, another way that God speaks to us is by vision. And I'm going to show you what Joel chapter 2 verse 28 says. Because in Joel chapter 2 verse 28, the, the channels with which God communicates to the young and the old was stated there. All together. Joel 2.28. So you see dreams. You see visions. Now, um, someone asks, what is the difference between dreams and vision? Now, dreams are the visions of the bed. The visions of the night. Dreams are the revelations that comes to you when you are asleep. Those are what dreams are. If you are not asleep, it cannot be called a dream. And visions are spontaneous revelations that comes to you by the hand of the Spirit of God. I'm, I don't want to define it in a generic way. I want to define it from my experience. You see? So dreams, you are asleep. And then a dream is given to you. And one thing about dreams is that a lot of times, dreams are not given in direct languages. They are given in dark sayings. 
Dreams are given in dark speeches. Dreams are given in similitudes. Don't expect to have a dream. It is rare to find a directly clear dream. Even Peter, when he entered into his trance, that's when he dozed off and entered into that trance, he saw similitudes that was given to him. I'm also going to explain what a trance is. Because if you look at trance, it can be induced also. A trance can actually be induced, but let's, let's simplify everything for the believers that may not understand. So it's not complex. A dream primarily is divine revelation brought to a person while his head is on the bed. All together. And a lot of times, all this divine revelation comes in similitudes. And one of the ways that we know a dream that is divine is that after you awake, the dream will linger. All together. The dream will what? It will linger. It's a message. It cannot be forgotten. It will linger. It will trouble you. It will linger within you. All together. So you can have dreams that reveals the mind of God, that reveals the future, that reveals an answer to a question, that reveals a warning. However, when you wake up from that sleep, how you will know that there's something unique about that dream is that that dream will linger in your heart. There'll be, it, will, it will linger, it will leave something in your heart. Now, I'll make bold to say this. Foolish dreams can be forgotten. But divine messages will linger. And although it comes in similitudes, do not despise it. Pray for understanding. Now, I'll also say this. You may not immediately get the interpretation to every dream you receive, even as a prophet. So don't rush to give your dreams interpretation. Don't contact a book to give your dreams interpretation. All together. Don't rush to give your dreams interpretations. Don't contact books and say, okay, I, I bought this book from the market. They told me if you see this, it means this. No, don't rush to give it an interpretation. Peter did not understand what that dream, that trance, that dream he had when he fell asleep. The Bible, Bible says he fell asleep and he saw what he saw. Peter did not completely understand that, what the meaning of that thing was until he went on that journey. So he now fully understood. A lot of times, God will give you certain dreams ahead of time that would only be fully understood when you are in that experience. And when you now understand the dream you had when you are in that experience, a lot of times those experiences are not experiences that will kill you. What happens to you is that you will be comforted in that experience. Because you know that, okay, God had already shown this to me, so I'm going to be okay. All together. So, don't rush. Be, we live in the generation where people rush to give interpretation to everything. Everyone is rushing. Please, don't rush. You can meditate on one dream for two weeks. All together. So, like I said, foolish dreams can be forgotten. Foolish dreams can be forgotten, but divine messages is difficult to forget. It lingers. It troubles you in your heart. Are we together? Is this okay for us? All together. So, what we call visions or revelations are those divine communications that comes to us spontaneously. 
And those divine communication comes with highly impactful experiences of another realm while this you are conscious. Do you understand what I'm saying? What we call visions or divine revelations are communications from God that comes with spontaneous experiences. Highly impactful, highly vivid, spontaneous experiences whilst that person is conscious. All together. So, I sit down here and I'm talking with you now and all of a sudden, my phone disappears. And my consciousness, although I'm looking at this phone, my consciousness is now as though I'm standing on a mountain somewhere. A lot of times you will see my body reacting to what my consciousness is seeing. Let me explain what a vision looks like in modern day English for us to understand. Now, have you ever gone to a 3D um, center? You know, there are these games that are 3D and they put the 3D glasses on you. And then, although you are conscious, although you know that what you are seeing is not real, however, you are seeing another realm. You are seeing whatever this computer is showing you and you are reacting to that effect. You are aware that you are in one world, but currently you are seeing another world. Now, these are, these are visions. Ah. So, a lot of times, when visions come to you, let's say I'm here with my, um, with my wife and we're talking, and a vision comes and I see a mighty angel come, I can fall on the ground because of the fear that will greet me. Now, my wife may not be even seeing what is happening to me. He will just see the husband fall on the ground and the husband is sweating on the ground. Meanwhile, my consciousness is now seeing something different. And it's an experience that only the one who is having that revelation, only the people who are slated to have that revelation would experience. All together. So, real-time visions are spontaneous spiritual experiences that are highly impactful and they come to you whilst you are conscious in real time. So, Ezekiel was with the slaves by the river Keba and the visions of God met him there. Now, people who sat by there would see Ezekiel just sitting down looking like this. Meanwhile, he's in another world. <laughs> All together. Now, visions can be described as illusions by psychiatrists. Because all oh, these are the illusion. And why visions cannot be categorized as illusions is because whatever is seen in that realm can impact this realm. All together. So, if not that, if the prophets of old did not give signs in their visions that came to pass in the physical world, their visions would have been classified as illusions of the mind. So what makes visions different from illusions is that the activity seen has some form of impact on the physical world. Why visions cannot be seen as hallucinations is that the activities seen there have impacts, have prophetic impacts on the natural world. If every time you have a vision, those visions or the things that are seen does not somehow have an impact on the natural world, what you are seeing is of no use to us. It can actually be described as an hallucination. Altogether. Yes, what so hard was a vision. What so hard was a clear vision. An obstasia, a vision. 
And guess what? It impacted his, his sight in the physical. Now, when that light beamed from heaven, everyone around the whole Damascus did not see the light. He saw that light in the spirit altogether. So now let me tell you something. Visions cannot be forced because it's a product of revelation. You cannot induce a vision. However, like I told you, by the understanding of time gate, you can be positioned for a vision. Visions are revelation. You cannot force it, but you can be positioned for it. You know, when I was re receiving this lecture, I was trying to determine what can be induced versus what can be received. When prophets went on long fasting, they were doing so also to raise their consciousness to a point between life and death. And in that point between life and death, their body enters a state that is like an induced state for revelation and trances. I see the ancient Indians, what they did was that they induced trances and revelation or they contacted the gods in the higher planes by smoking. You know, there's something they smoke by the, by the fireside. And when they smoke all these things, their mind gets to a place where it is now high. They, they induce a state on themselves that makes the demons that they contact easily reach them. Altogether. Hope um, you are at least getting what I'm saying. So prophets, for example, if you go on a very long fast, you can self-induce an hallucinative state. You can induce an you can bring yourself to an hallucinative state. Now it is believed that for spiritual people, when you bring yourself to that state, to that place where your flesh is so weak that there is a thin line between your being present in the body and being absent in the body, you've heightened yourself to a place where you can easily be reached. You understand what I'm saying? So, prophets stayed in the wilderness when they were fasting. Now, let me tell you something. There is something the harsh environment of the wilderness does to your brain. There is something the sun in the wilderness. There was no shade. It it took them to a state of mind. And from that state, it was easier for them to receive their revelations or their visions. Altogether. And this is why you can't be so occupied or preoccupied in the flesh and expect to be positioned for visions. So you see prophets are fasting and they are praying, they are fasting, they are praying, they are fasting, they are praying. They are bringing their mind to a state where they can be easily reached. And there are also types of vision that are enforced on you. Those type of vision, they don't, whether you are fasting or not, they come by the sovereignty of God. That's a different types of vision. Are we together? So, you can actually Put yourself in a place where you are high and it's easy for you to receive. It's easy for you to receive your divine revelation and vision. Very easy. And this thing is not only exclusive to Christian belief. When Old Testament prophets fasted, they fasted in very harsh environments. Because even biologically, that is what that does to your brain. When witches of those days wanted to go into visions, they burnt, you know, highly intoxicating leaves, you know, leaves that can be classified as weed. You know, they have the same effect as all this weed and all this cocaine. They, they, they will burn it as incense around themselves. And as you inhale those things, it takes your brain to a trance-like place. And in that heightened state, the demons they're in contact with can easily approach them. Now, 
Let me be honest to you and tell you a very deep secret. The logical mind is an enemy of spiritual encounter. Thank you, Prophet Olopade. In induced hypnotism is a hypnotic state. Altogether, the logical cognitive mind is an enemy of revelation. Take this statement to the bank. What you want to do if you want to be a genuine oracle is to disconnect yourself from the matter you want to prophesy about. Don't have a bias. Don't think it. You don't think prophecy. You speak under inspiration. It doesn't, it's not processed through your logical mind. Yes, some born incense. Now, what this burning of incense does is that it starves your body of, of oxygen. Because you are taking in this smell and less oxygen and less oxygen. After a long period of time, you begin to hallucinate. And then those demons can easily reach you. Because for you to actually interact with a higher realm, you need to get out of the logical mind. It is used by Native Americans as well, exactly. You see? Now, that is the induced state. That fasting, long fasting especially, that's the induced state it gets you to. There is a difference between fasting long inside your room and fasting long in the wilderness somewhere. It has two different effects. You can't be fasting under AC, a good toilet, and then you are still sleeping on a cushion bed. I say, okay, you know, I'm fasting to have a, a revelation. And, you know, you still have access to juice and TV and your phone. You are not serious. You see, it will be difficult. I, I Sorry, you are serious, but it will be difficult. But if you fasted the ways the old prophet fasted, they went to desert places. The heat came down on them. The night cold hit them. The harsh environment caused their mind to enter to a level of consciousness where it was easy for them to have these visions altogether. These are part of the things that you need to learn in the prophetic school. You see? So, in those days, prophets were very mighty in Revelation because of the type of things they put their body through just to elevate their consciousness. All these things we're talking about is consciousness elevation. And the more elevated your spiritual consciousness is, consciousness is, the more foolish your cognitive mind has to become, if it makes any sense. Your logical mind has to become foolish for your spiritual mind to become wise. But if your logical mind is wise, your spiritual mind will be foolish. Take it that way. You want your spiritual mind to be wise, your logical mind has to become foolish. So what fasting does for you is that it makes your logical mind become more foolish so that your spiritual mind will become heightened. Hello, thank you for watching the video and I hope it was a great asset to you. And I hope it was also very useful time. If you haven't commented, if you haven't liked, please do that. And for more videos, kindly subscribe to our YouTube channel to get more videos. God bless.